When A did this, he was smart enough to realize, oh, look, that lake is actually on the other property, but I want a right to get to it. So he actually created a second easement right there that's going to allow A to walk over to the lake. But notice in this case, A is taking the use of B's property. That makes A the dominant property. And it makes B the servant property. So what I'm telling you is the dominant and servant properties are dependent upon which easement we're talking about. Because in the road easement, A is the servant property or the servient tenement. But in the lake or pond easement, A is the dominant tenement. All right? It depends, and we can play this game. In the road, B is dominant. In the lake, B is the servant one. So it depends on which is taking and giving and which easement defines the definition. Now, in this particular drawing, this is called an appurtenant easement. An appurtenant easement or easement appurtenant. You'll hear it called both ways, which means it's public. So anybody that's trying to get to B legally gets the right to use A's land. B himself, the UPS guy, the police, the B's friends coming over to watch the football game, anything. It's in a pertinent easement, meaning it has the public has the right to use it. Same thing with this one. Anybody that's legally at A's house gets to go to the lake because it, it as well is an easement appurtenant. Anybody can use that that's legally at A. Let's make that clear. I meant, you know, burglars, somebody trespassing, that's a different story. <clears throat> but that's what a pertinent easement is. Now, a lot of times you will see condos, or we talked about single family attached properties, and I told you they had a zero lot line. The two houses are pushed right up, sharing a wall. There will be a party wall easement because the left house has to have the structure of the entire wall to support it, but it only owns half of that wall. I mean, think about that two by four that's laying there. You know, the property line's right in the middle. It still needs the full structure. So he is getting the right of to use the full structure to support his house. But so is the property on the left is using that guy's side of the two by four. That would be a prop party wall easement where the property is straddling the actual property line. Now, this next one always confuses me because I never really understood. In gross, I always thought meant total. There is this thing called an easement in gross, and an easement in gross is only an easement for one particular party, not the public. So let's go back to this drawing here for a second, and let me add something new. Well, that's not what I wanted to add new. What I wanted to add new was power lines because this is an example of an easement in gross is a utility easement where this easement that people drive back here to fix is only good as a public, or misspoke, I don't want to use that word. It's only good as an easement to the power company. If you walk across the back of my property there, that's trespassing. It's not an, a pertinent easement. It's not for the public. It's only an easement for the power line. It's only an easement for utility companies is a great example. And they can buy and sell these. Railroad tracks might be another good example. It's only good for the railroad. And when those companies get bought and sold, those easements get bought and sold with it. 
Now, every one of those easements that we have talked about up till now have been voluntarily made. Remember, these easements here were made by A because before A sold the property, he actually owned it. So it's very easy to make that easement by agreement because all A did was go, hey, I want to make an agreement with you. And then he went, hey, okay, let's do that because he still owned A. He hadn't sold it yet. Then he makes the easement, then he sells it. So you can voluntarily make these easements up until now. However, there are a couple situations in when this easement is actually not voluntarily made. They are made for against a person's wishes or a will. Now, sidebar. This is what I was mentioning earlier. With the life estate, talking about the simplistic. Here is a case of something I want you to know. And the test wants you to know that I will tell you in real life probably will never happen in practice. All right. And you'll see why here in just a second. So there is this easement that is called an easement by necessity. So let's say the farmer decides he's got a hundred acres and he is going to sell 10 acres right here. And this is the hundred acre wood, right? And who lives in the 100 acres wood? Anybody? Winnie the Pooh. That's right. So he sells this 10 acres. It is impossible for the owner of this property to actually get to that property without trespassing in some manner. And since possession is one of the five bundles of rights that gets transferred, what happens in this case is the title company will literally make an easement and it is called an easement by necessity. It allows the new owner the ingress and egress from the property. It will be created by an act of law. All right? That's what I want you to know. Now, sidebar. In the real world, what would happen is this deal wouldn't close. <laughs> the title company is going to go say, hey, dude, we're not going to make this. We're not going to spend the time, the effort, and the money to create this easement for you. You need to go, Mr. Farmer, and create an easement, get it recorded, then come back to us and we'll sell the property, okay? But that's really not going to help us much in understanding this. So an easement by necessity gets created when this happens, okay? There now, so what you got is this guy that lives here, and every morning he gets up, gets in his car, and he drives out of his easement, and he drives down the country road to the country road, makes a stop here, and goes out this way to the highway to go to work. See, a lot of these times you need the context and the backstory to understand what's going on. So he gets tired of doing that. So what he decides to do is just sneak out across the back, across the field, and drive right off under the road and go to the highway that way. This is what is called an easement by prescription. An easement by prescription. And for this easement by prescription to happen, he actually needs five things to happen. One is it has to be open, meaning everybody sees him doing it. It has to be notorious, meaning everybody knows it's him. We know it's the, the guy that lives there that does it. It has to be visible, meaning he's doing it not just at night in the dark, and it has to be hostile, meaning without the current owner's permission. And it has to be continuous and uninterrupted, which is the next term. Now, depending on the state, the time frame could be anywhere from 9 to 21 years. And I'm not guaranteeing that's absolutely right. 
could be 7 to 21, but it doesn't matter. So it has to be open, continuous, notorious, uh, hostile, and against the true owner's possession, meaning he, the true owner can't be living there on the farm. That's his property, okay? Now, back to this. It has to be what they call continuous and uninterrupted. And they allow for what is called tacking. What does a thumbtack do? It sticks or holds two things together, right? So what I'm saying is, let's say this guy here does that, and he does it for three years. And he's open, continuous, notorious, hostile, all of that. He then sells this property to the next guy, and he says, hey, look, dude, uh, the street, you can go out and go around, but I've just been cutting across the back. And the second owner does it. He can tack his six years in for this example to get to the allotted numbers. That is called tacking. That is continuous. It has been nine years, even though it's been two owners doing it. Then that person could apply for that to become an appurtenant easement, which means now the public can use that across this guy's land. Now, it has to also be uninterrupted. So what I'm saying here is, let's say the first guy, go back to our example, does it for three years. And he sells the property to the second guy and says, hey, man, I've been going out the back for three years. Go ahead and do it. And the second guy says, no, I'm not a lawbreaker. I'm going to follow the rules. And he doesn't do it at all. And then he sells it to the third guy. And he's like, hey, look, the guy before me said he was driving out the back. I haven't done that, but you do whatever you want to do. And then the third guy says, okay, and he does it for six years. That is not nine years because it has to be continuous, but it also has to be uninterrupted. And it was interrupted. This guy would have to start over and do it for the full nine years or sell it to someone down the road who would then tack it on to his. All right? So it has to be tacking is possible with successors in interest, successor ownerships. <coughs> now, their easements can terminate, and there are ways that the easements can terminate. But I want you to understand, I'm going to try and give you a hint for a test question, and I'm not going to tell you. It can or may terminate. Understand that easements have to be agreed to and recorded. They also have to be, and I don't want to say the word unrecorded, they have to be released from recording. And the only people that can do that are the parties that are involved in the easement. I can't make someone else's easement go away. I can only make easements on my property. So there are several ways to terminate it when it happens. Several reasons is probably a better word. And if you think about that, that might be easier. There are several reasons to terminate. When the purpose is for which is created no longer exists. Let's go back to that. Maybe this guy's well, I got to remember to get rid of that. Did I erase it? I most certainly did. <laughs> um, remember I told you that there were uh, forest up here, which is why he made the easement to begin with. B went up and over like this. Let's say he erases or decides he's going to cut down those trees to make room for his own driveway. That might be a reason when there's no longer a need for that easement would be when either one of the parties become both the dominant and server. 
So in other words, A buys B's house or B could buy the A house and now they own both properties. That would be a reason for it to be terminated. One of the owners could release. Now it has to be, uh, has to, the release of the right of the easement to the owner of the servant tenant, meaning the guy's not going to need it anymore. I'm going to abandon it, which is the fourth reason. Or because of non-use, all right? Now, there are privileges that an owner can give to a friend, a partner, a neighbor, whomever, to use their property for a specific person, or <laughs> for a specific reason. Well, it is a specific person. It is called a license. If you are a deer hunter, potentially fisherman also, this is something you see where you've getting, you have been given permission to be on my land to hunt deer, and I gave you a license. It is a verbal, watered-down version. It's not recorded. It's usually just given between good old boys and can be terminated at will by either party or terminated upon the death of the owner or the sale of the property. So there's three things that actually terminate, make sure. I could say, I no longer want you to hunt on my property, get off. That would terminate it at will, anytime. If I sold that, property to someone else. You can't hunt on that land anymore because I don't own that land. I can't give you the permission. Or if I died and someone else took ownership. So it's a right or a privilege that is granted by the owner, usually for a specific purpose. All right. An encroachment is a physical extension of someone else's property that extends across a property line to my property. We mentioned one a little earlier, you know, and I said, oh, you've got this tree that your neighbor planted, but right here is the property line. But remember, that is my airspace, so I can, in essence, cut this tree because it has encroached upon my property and back to what we were talking about. You know, you, you may have sunlight coming in here and it's blocking your solar panels on your house and you need to kill that encroachment. So an encroachment is a physical entity that extends upon your property line. Now, the last one here is thrown in because it does kind of affect the title, meaning it, uh, it, it puts an interest in, uh, on a person's title. And remember, an interest does not include possession. It is called a Liz Pendens. Liz Pendens. A Liz Pendens is Latin for litigation pending. It is not a lawsuit. It's a future lawsuit, meaning I may file a lawsuit. And it, when those get filed, when a Liz Pendens get filed, it will actually block the owner from being able to sell the property, which is exactly what we want it to do because... You do not want that person that's going to be subject to a lawsuit to go out and get rid of all his assets so you can't collect. Think of the Liz Pendens as kind of like the surprise attack. All right. I don't want to get too in depth because when we get to the liens chapter, we will go in depth, but it is a fact that I would put something on your house and said, hey, look, I think I'm going to sue the owner of this property. So I had my attorney file a Liz Pendens, which is litig litigation pending. Now the owner of this house goes to sell and the title company is going to go, hey, wait a minute, dude. 
there is a person that has an interest in your property from a lawsuit. And you go, well, I didn't even know there was a lawsuit filed. Yes, there was a Liz Pendens filed two days ago. Before we can allow you to transfer a title, you have got to go take care of this lawsuit somehow. Then when you're satisfied, come back to us. All right? So that's a Liz Pendon, which is litigation pending. Now, what we get into now is the governmental powers, which is where we started with this chapter. So understand that this chapter deals with the estate in property, which defines the degree of ownership. And that ownership is held as either a freehold or a leasehold. And what defines those is the amount of time in which the owner owns the property. An undefined amount of time versus a defined amount of time. And then you can define how much is it absolute? Does it have some defeasance on it? All of that. Then we talked about a different other types of encumbrances. And, and an encumbrance is often said to run with the property. All right. Meaning that an encumbrance like those liens, or not those liens, those encumbrances that will stay and I can't get rid of <clears throat> that shared driveway that we had. I can go back and redraw this real quick. Remember, you got that driveway, you got that shared driveway. This encumbrance on this property runs with the land because when I sell it, it will still be there to the next owner. Another term you hear it often called is it survives the closing, meaning after the closing, it's still there, which you want it to be there because B still wants to be able to access this property, even though A sold the property. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You guys have my emails. It's Raymond at realuniversity.com. And uh, feel free to ask me anything. And if you've got concerns, let's talk. I'll see you at the next chapter.